In the beginning of time, there was great conflict between Tane Mahuta, god of the forest, and his brother Tangaroa, god of the sea. Tangaroa was jealous of Tane Mahuta's success in separating Ranganui, the sky father, from Papatuanuku, the earth mother. Tane Mahuta tried to end the warring between them, and as a sign of peace, plucked out his eyebrows and gave them to Tangaroa. Tangaroa's jealousy was so great that he could not find it in his heart to forgive Tane, and threw the eyebrows back onto the shore. There they grow today as Pingao, the golden sand sedge, as the boundary between the forest and the sea. Pingao, otherwise known as Pikau, or golden sand sedge, is a Tonga that is endemic to New Zealand. That means this is the only place in the world where it grows. It's an integral part of the coastal ecosystem and a prized weaving material, but it's also under threat. Populations around the country are continuing to decline and there's much that remains a mystery about this little plant. Some fear, if we don't remedy this soon, we may lose Pingau from our shores forever. Luckily for us, in 2013, a group of very passionate people all around New Zealand got together and started a project. This project is looking at the differences between Pingau populations in what the plants look like and how they grow, as well as they're trying to raise awareness about the ecological and cultural significance of Pingau. Hopefully, by combining Western science and Mātauranga Māori, we can uncover the secrets of Pingau and help to protect it for future generations of Kiwis to enjoy. Pingau was once common throughout the country, growing all the way from Cape Reinga down to Stewart Island. And because of this, it's well known in Māori culture for its weaving properties. So in June 2016, we held a workshop at Lincoln University that was focused on just this. Some of our key collaborators shared their insights into why combining Mātauranga Māori with Western science is so important and how this process is applicable to saving Pingau. Really important um, in Aotearoa to, when we think about Western science and Mātauranga Māori, is to remember that um, look, Mātauranga Māori is actually the first science that was here in this country. When the early settlers came here and were discovering and exploring Aotearoa, um, and naming things and figuring out the connections and the environment and the ecology, uh, that, was, that was science. And so the ways that Western science, sort of a later thing, uh, connects to Mātauranga Māori um, is really important to, to keep uh, exploring those connections. Yeah. People in Pinga are weaving the connections is about bringing people together who have interest in Pingau, but those people are across the board, they're conservationists, weavers, um, local people, um, scientists, biologists, uh, just people who have a story to tell about Pingau, uh, whether it's the Pingau or the Katipo spider or the, uh, the Kie Kie. Um, and so uh, the project's really about bringing people together and their different knowledges and their different knowledge streams that um, um, and exploring the ways that those complement each other. Mm. Couldn't be one-sided, it would have to involve both using the science to get people informed and um, about why this plant is really important in terms of genetic diversity and whatnot, but also, you know, the Māori side of things, mm. its importance in weaving and, um, and in Māori history. So not only are Mātauranga Māori and Western science inherently linked, but they're also essential to helping each other out and giving us a great idea of how to study and conserve a native species like Pingau. But before you can study anything, you need to understand its background and its relationship with the people who grew up caring for it. So we go to the source. We go where it is in its natural environment. We had karakia and she goes, oh, am I going to be all right? You know, very, very worried about it. Mm -hmm. I says, yeah, it's a plant that you look after and um, get to love if you really want to weave. Um, I call it the gold. It's like bronze, silver and gold. This is my category. It's um, bronze is hakeke, keke is the silver, and um, pingao is the gold. Many are concerned that if we keep harvesting pingao from the wild, we might actually contribute to their population decline and so they've started to grow pingao in their own backyards. This is not an easy plant to grow in your own garden, but science might be able to help out. Dr Hannah Buckley can explain more. This gave Robin plants and she planted them in her garden and they grew really well, I think about five years, but I just emailed her last week and she sent me, um, she sent me this picture actually of the harvest she got from it. 
but she said all the plants are dead now. Mm. And so, and I think that's pretty typical from what I've heard from people who have worked on pingal before is that it doesn't really sus get sustained too well in gardens. However, I was talking to Daphne and Daphne was saying that her son, I think it was, has grown some pingal in his garden and he actually created a bed of sand and the pingal is still there after 10 years. So one of the things that I thought was, was actually really interesting is does the genetic, do the different genetic varieties perform differently in different garden conditions? And would that be interesting to know? Because how many people are interested in growing their own pingal? If you can grow your own and get a harvest like that from five plants, is that something that people would be interested in doing? In which case the science could be done to tell you how you could get the, the most out of that. How great would it be if we could grow pingal in our own backyards? It would give us a separate, sustainable source of weaving material. Although, you've got to admit there's nothing quite like seeing our native plants growing in their natural environment. And it's here where they provide essential services for the coastal ecosystem. They can provide things like food and shelter for animals such as the New Zealand dotterel and native moths and butterflies. They also bind the sand together and actually create sand dunes, and this protects the land from high seas and storms. So it's really important that we put a lot of effort into maintaining the natural populations. And this is where people like Jason Roberts come in. If we didn't have people like myself or any of the other park rangers working and keeping the sand where it is, um, and we left it alone, I would say that we would be in a lot of trouble. Um, one of the big roles of the job is also providing access for people to come to the beach. Keeping people on those walkways has proven over the years to be a, a, a big job in itself. When people obviously walk on the vegetation and kill the ping out spinifex, um, the sand becomes mobile and starts moving again. If it was free rain for that to happen, obviously the sand would move as well as the destruction we may have from wave run up and storm events. We are constantly replacing vegetation to stabilise the dunes and that's simply because the dunes have been pushed into a a very small space where they want to breathe, they're not able to do that anymore. We don't have enough ping out, and that goes back to what Stacey is saying, we need a lot more ping out, and we used to have people, the public or the locals helping us grow it, and that's a, a program that we need to get back into action, and it seems like that's going to pick up speed now too, and it is simply because we can't get enough of the plant itself to put it on the dune. There would be nothing prettier than being able to walk the whole 25 k's and seeing ping out along the whole length of the beach. So how can science help us conserve ping out? Well for that, we're going to have to go to the biggest population in New Zealand, a little place called Kaitareti Spit. It was here that we started plant sampling. Because of the immense size of the population, we thought it would be our best bet to find any and all interactions that ping out was having with the animals and the environment around it. So we started off taking GPS coordinates of the plant and describing how it was situated on the beach and then how the specific tussock we were taking is situated compared to the rest of the plant. We then would measure the height, width and breadth of the plant above ground and then we started digging. So pingao have a couple of different types of roots and one can be quite thin and fragile so we had to be really careful while digging them up by hand as to not break any roots because we wanted to take the plant exactly how it was growing in the wild. But what makes that even harder is that there are little critters hiding in the sand that make a meal out of the roots and this makes them even more fragile. So this is a Pericoptis larva. Pericoptis is a genus or a group of sand scarab beetles that are endemic to New Zealand. They mature in the sand over winter and then come to the surface as adults during summer. They've always been known to feed on dead and rotting plant material in the sand, but we've found them among the roots of almost every pingar plant we've dug up. This must mean that pingao is a really important food source for them on these beaches. So we also took some sand samples from right underneath the plant. We did some hand searching for katapo spiders and we did an extremely detailed GPS map of a 10 meter by 10 meter plot of the sand dune. This last step was to see how the plant growth affects the dune morphology and why dunes might be different shapes on different beaches. But what has all this got to do with the conservation of pingao? Well, to answer that, we've got to talk a little bit more to Hannah Buckley. We're trying to find out how important this variation in pingo is around New Zealand. We know that this plant varies from place to place and what it looks like and how it grows. And we're trying to understand how important that variation is for the ecosystem that pingo forms. Pingo is a sand binding species, so it binds the sand to form the sand dune. And what we want to know is, 
are the genetic differences in pingau important for formation of the dune or the kinds of habitat that it can provide for biodiversity? So by comparing these different plants from different populations around New Zealand, we're also trying to understand the characteristics that make pingau from different places more or less desirable for weaving. We've learned through our collaborations in this project that the two most important features of the plant for weaving are its colour and the length of its leaves. And so what we want to know is what are the causes of this variation? And so we know that some of this is caused by genetics, so the genetic differences among the populations, but we also suspect that environmental causes have something to do with it too. So we believe that understanding the variation in pingau is going to help us conserve this species. We know that pingau is still declining around New Zealand, and this research is going to tell us more about what it is that we're losing. So we think that this research is going to be really informative for the conservation of pingau. It's important for any species to maintain genetic diversity so that it can be resilient in the face of future threats, things like climate change. In the case of pingau, if the genetic diversity in the species translates to how it functions in the ecosystem, then it's really important for us to think about how we're going to maintain that diversity around New Zealand so that we can keep those dune ecosystems functioning. We can't wait to keep learning about this amazing plant. But in the meantime, we're lucky enough to have some dedicated people that can pass on the current knowledge to the future generation. I recently had the pleasure of meeting Betsy Young, who goes into schools in Northland and teaches the students about weaving with and caring for pingau. If we can go into the schools to teach the children the importance of what this little plant does, it stabilises and it keeps the sand where it is, rather than across onto our land. So just very simple things that the children should understand. Locally there are lots of community groups, for example the Sumner Environment Group uh, are growing and planting pingau on their own beach in Sumner and we have groups all along the coast in Christchurch that are, that are, that are working in their own particular areas. Um, the City Council has given away plant uh, seed for people to grow and they can adopt a pingau and, and help replant each year, we have a planting season. Um, Nationwide, the Trust supports community groups and we have an annual conference for community groups uh, hope to improve people's planting skills and, and just their general awareness of the coast. A day on the beach is as fundamentally Kiwi as LMP or any of our native birds, but this means that caring for pingau and the beach as a whole is not just the responsibility of scientists or iwi, but it's something that every single New Zealander can take part in and take ownership of. If you'd like to know more about the easy ways that you can help, please visit the June Restoration Trust website or get in touch with Dr. Hannah Buckley.